Okay, from the consumer of the future to future trends for publishers. What are the trends that are going to affect all of us most in the coming months and years? Please welcome the group publisher of Harvard Business Review, Josh Macht. Thank you so much. Thanks for... Um, oh, oh, here we go. Okay, thanks so much for having me here today. Um, I'm going to go through this. If you do have questions as I as I go through the presentation, just raise your hands and happy to take them. Um, I am going to talk about big trends in publishing, but I'm going to start first with a story. And the story is meant to show why I think, as publishers, we often have such a hard time with finding these, you know, experimenting with new trends. And it's much more difficult than just simply saying, here are some things on the horizon. And the story is going to take us back to around 2002. Now, in 2002, I was the editor of Time Magazine's uh, digital uh, efforts. I was the editor of Time.com. But I was also the editor of the Life Digital Life Magazine. And Life, at that point, Life Magazine was defunct. But I was the editor of kind of Life.com, which wasn't really getting any traffic or doing much. And so, you know, I was a lot younger then. Uh, I probably looked a little bit different. But anyway, I went you know, with all my exuberance to the higher ups. And I said, now remember, in 2002, there was no smartphone. right? I mean, there, this, this hadn't really been invented. In 2002, Flickr, I don't know if you guys remember Flickr, the photo sharing site, that didn't exist. But we knew digital photography was a big deal. And life had a lot of photos. We had 11 million photos. And for me and my team, we thought, this is huge because these are iconic photos that people will want to share, they'll want access to, and maybe they'll want to keep and share their own photos. So with all of our exuberance, we went forward, put together a business plan, went in front of the executives, and they were like, uh, nah, we don't even really get what you're talking about. We sort of understand digital photography, but we're not sure how this would work. Instead, they wanted to pursue a different business plan. Now, can anyone guess or remember what Life Magazine did at that time? I'm sure people don't, but if someone does, just raise your hand. Instead of this, they did something very different. They decided to do a newspaper insert in 2002. OK, now you can chuckle, because you look back on this and you think to yourself, what in the world were they thinking? It's 2002. What? could they possibly be doing? Life Magazine, as we, you know, this is what we did. We printed paper. The idea of a digital site for photography, even though there were these weak signals and trends, was really tough to imagine. Even though we were on the cusp of the biggest collapse of all time. I mean, we were on the cusp of it. We were right there. The signs were like, do not go there. Don't try to partner with newspapers put your, your, your insert in there to compete with Parade, it seemed, I mean, I remember the business plan. It seemed like it made all the sense in the world. I think some of our, uh, the people who contribute to HBR would call this the dominant logic. There's so much dominant logic inside of everyone's organization. This seems silly in retrospect, but it happens all the time. In the United States, Blockbuster Video's most profitable year was the same year Netflix was born. These weak trends, these weak signals, are incredibly difficult to see, find, identify, and experiment with. It's just really, really tough. You have to come up with a plan for how you're going to go about this systematically, culturally, organizationally. And I just put that out there as a caveat in the very beginning, because you know, I just, I've sat through too many presentations where people talk about these you know, trends, but yet we don't really capitalize upon them. So, for us at HBR, weak signals are hugely important. And this is how we define them, right? And we're looking five or 10 years out. We're looking at things that right now maybe aren't huge, but they could change how our customers interact with us fundamentally. With something like this that could disrupt your current business, it could alter your competitive set, it could force you to rethink everything you do, you can't go all in and invest you know, 25 million, whatever, in a new business here. It's just too risky. 
What you really need is a much leaner approach to experimenting. And the trends that I'm going to talk about, I don't really know if I come back in five or 10 years if all of these things will have capsized my business. I doubt they will have. The point is to experiment. And as the signal gets stronger, you won't get blindsided. That's the trick. Easier said than done. I try to practice this every day. I know how hard it is, OK? So that's kind of, just before I move on into some of these trends, that's the big caveat setup. Are there just any questions on that part before I, before I move on? OK, so what are some of those trends? Well, some of them the speakers have talked about here already. And I'm going to go into them and look, just quickly show you how five of these trends, how we look at them. Now, I've chosen these two because these are also trends that I think HBR is uniquely suited to try to capitalize upon. But that doesn't mean that others can't as well. The first one is this conversational interface, right? We're hearing a lot about conversational interfaces. Um, I'm just going to get everything up here. So we sort of look at it kind of, you know, why is the signal getting stronger? What's happening? What is happening right now? What do we see around us? And then what can we do as HBR? In this case, it's very clear, right? All of a sudden, people are talking with Siri, Alexa, Google Home, and you name it. And we see, right, that it's early days. But there's something about talking to the computer that seems to be changing things. My feeling is that the battle for the car is going to be bigger than the battle for the living room. That as people do have more time, this interaction and speaking with the computer is going to become a huge way that people get their media and learn. It's tied to other trends that I'll talk about. We see it now happening with a lot more podcasts are growing. That's an early tr trend. By the way, there's another trick to understanding an early trend. Watch where the venture capitalists put their money. But don't just look at where they put their money. Look at where they put their money and things are growing fast. So if all of a sudden there's a lot of money, venture cap money, flowing into podcasts, that's interesting. If there are podcast companies that are starting to grow from a low base and doubling in size or tripling in size, that's really interesting. Right? This is another way, just kind of a little trick to, to looking at weak signals. So what are we doing right now? Well, you know, we've always had an idea cast. We're, our podcast is pretty big at HBR. We have over a million people who download an episode. We, the reach is great. We're adding new podcasts there. But on the conversational side, we started this experiment with Alexa. It is totally primitive, 100% primitive. It's not really. It's just kind of like listening to radio at this point. But the idea is we want to get in the flow of what that might be like to get content from us, to ask the computer for content for us. It, it relates to machine learning, which I'll tie into in a second. I think the other big one that we've seen, and this one's been around for a while, is this notion of immersive storytelling. Um, the New York Times did something called Snowfall a number of years ago, which was huge. Um, the sharper screens, the maturing technologies around AR and VR that we've just seen from our last speaker, the growth of social, these are adding to the experiment, to, to, to fueling this trend. Now, there's a lot happening on this front. Right, this notion of immersive storytelling. If you look at a lot of magazines are playing with AR and VR, you can see it all over the place, which is interesting. Um, there's another huge caveat. A lot of these magazines that are playing with this stuff, I'd argue it's just playing. You know, I could give you a number of examples from The Guardian to a lot of places that are doing really cool stuff with this technology, but they are struggling financially. So you, again, you've got to be careful. How is your business functioning today cannot be sacrificed for the experimentation of tomorrow. It's all about finding the right balance. What HBR is doing on this front is something called the big idea. The big idea for us is what I would sort of call the eventification of an article. Most of our contributors still want to be in print. Print is hugely valuable. But we wanted to do long form journalism, digital only. And the way we did that is, we said to the contributor, if you do something that goes through our editorial process, review just like anything in print, we are going to make kind of unfold this over a period of a week or two. So the big idea is something that the reader signs up for. They get the first piece. We did our first one on Rebel Talent with a uh, contributor named Francesca Gino. She's a professor at the Harvard Business School. 
Um, on the third week, we ended up doing an event with her and Ed Catmull. Ed Catmull's the president of Pixar. We did an event in San Francisco. The two of them are there with our editor-in-chief, Adi Ignatius. If you had signed up for this big piece around uh, Rebel Talent, we called it, you would get notification about the event. You could go to its streaming. If you were in San Francisco, you could attend it live. The point is we want to bring you much deeper into the content. That's our version of immersive storytelling. It's experiment, but it's actually going well. We're on our sixth one now. We do them every other month. Um, machine learning is another huge one we hear a lot about. It seems almost as if, in some ways, this is just something that Google owns, right? It was a match made in heaven. There's so much data in the world. Uh, we found ways to make machines smarter by ingesting this data. And guess who happens to have all the data? It's, it's Google. So it looks as though they are uh, you know, just poised to dominate it, and they do. I'd say that this is a, a weak signal. Um, and you can see that there's some things happening already. Some news wires are working with machine learning to produce stories. That's somewhat interesting. Um, our view on this is a little different. The, we've been experimenting with Facebook Messenger and, uh, and a bot for Facebook Messenger and Slack, which is a productivity tool that people share, um, uh, use to share. A lot of people, especially developers, use this tool. The bot works such that you can kind of interact with it to ask for more about uh, HBR articles. The reason why I tie it to machine learning is I think what we need to do is get better at understanding people's questions about our content. The, the smarter we are about their questions, the faster we can do to recognize those or use machines to recognize how to use our content to get to the right answers quickly. And that's hugely important for us. Uh, the fourth one here is online learning. This, again, um, all of a sudden massive trend in education. Uh, companies like Coursera, I don't know if folks have heard of them, edX, Khan Academy, of course. These companies are exploding. Um, a lot of venture capital money being put into them. In the United States, it's, it's hugely uh, interesting because the debt load of education is just so overbearing that online education is seen as a huge growth market. Interestingly, places like Fortune Magazine have partnered to create uh, online, use their content for online learning platforms. So you can already see some publishers really trying to experiment with this. For HBR, I think one thing is we're fortunate because we're part of the Harvard Business School, which launched something called HBX, which is a big online learning platform. So we get a window into that. But also, what we're doing with our content is we're taking our content, coupling it with online learning tools, and now we're even trying to experiment with shaping some of that content into courses that people might want and use. Again, it's experimentation. That's really what it's meant to be. Uh, and the last one that I'll talk about and show here is this notion of interactive video. So this trend, for sure, uh, is, is, is fairly early on. There is a lot of technology out there where people can interact with videos in different ways. Some has been around for a long time. It's just starting to really bubble up. I'd argue, in many ways, that Facebook Live is the best example of this. And, and this is the last one, and, and I'll say, we. We already do a lot with webinars, and I bet a lot of people here may already do a lot with webinars. This is a great example where Facebook Live has made us really rethink our webinar strategy. We are using this in an interactive way. The second trap is setting unrealistic expectations. This is a particular issue when you've come through a recruiting process and you think you've got a view of what you need to do. And you may be very enthused, and you may be wanting to have a, an impact. And there's a real tendency to you know, overpromise and, in the end, underdeliver in a situation like this. So this is Michael Watkins. He's one of our best-selling authors. He wrote uh, the book, The First 90 Days. Um, the Facebook Live allows for thousands of thousands of people to come in and interact with him. At, at uh, HBS, the case study method is, is a very big deal. And it's, called participant-centered learning. It's about getting the audience to be, interact with you around concepts. We're trying to do that with Facebook Live. And it's actually been quite successful. The, this series is called our whiteboarding sessions. And again, we do them a couple times a week. We already have a video crew. The editorial staff said, yeah, let's try it. And we experimented. Uh, so it's just us experimenting with a trend that I think will grow and we'll see. That just 
Last but not least, and before there are any questions here, you know, I just want to reiterate, we, um, we're looking at our business every day and s trying to survive just as everyone is, the way it's currently constructed. And that takes up most of our time. The experimentation with uh, the future probably takes up 10%, 20% of our time at most, at most, probably, but realistically about 10%. And I say that because I think it's really important that the organization realizes that you can't do it all and you will be stretched, but you do need to find ways to open up capacity to experiment with the future. A lot of times that means letting go of things that you currently do that no longer create value. This is the most difficult conversation I have with the editorial team. It is a real struggle for all of us because when we create things, we, we typically don't want to let go because if we're really good editors, we're somewhat emotionally attached. But at some point, you do have to let go of things. And even with this experimentation, you have to do it in a rigorous way such that what are you trying to learn by when and at what point do you cut bait? You just can't keep slathering on new things and expect the organization to handle that. It will break. It will become exhausted. And I think most of us in publishing are. If I probably asked you to raise your hands, are you tired? Everyone would probably say, yeah, because we're all exhausted. It's exhausting trying to keep up with the future. You have to find a way within your culture to do it in a way that's suited. But I can, I can tell you it's going to mean letting go of some things that you're currently doing. And, and that's always difficult and tricky, but hopefully the rewards are, are, uh, are worth it in the long run. So that's my, my, quick, my quick little presentation. And um, hopefully you have questions. But if not, I'm around. And thank you again for having me. Thank you, Josh. So if you do have any questions, as usual, I have one. So we have uh, two here. So we're now going to use our throwing skills, or lack of. Who's the first guy? Someone here. There we are. Thank you. Thanks. First of all, thank you for that. I thought it was the best, uh, best presentation of the Congress so far. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, really interesting. <laughs> uh, so, so what I wanted we to ask... We don't work together. I don't know him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's very totally random. That's not what you said last night. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so, this is a family yeah, yeah. show. Let's keep Sorry. Going. Okay, so what I wanted to ask was... Um, you talk about identifying weak signals, uh, and we've also heard a lot about filtering, in, especially in the previous presentation. So is there a mechanism that you use? There's a lot of weak signals out there, right? So there's a ton of stuff going on. Is there a mechanism that you use internally when you're going to the editorial teams to, you know, to filter